Whenever you're online shopping through your favorite businesses, whether that be Allo or Gymshark, and you get the rush of adding something to your cart and heading to checkout, so rarely do you ever think about the business behind the business. The business that makes selling so easy and for shoppers, buying so easy. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. It is home of the number one checkout on the planet. With ShopPay that boosts conversions up to 50%, meaning there is way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going up. So if you're into growing your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell whenever your customers are scrolling or strolling on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout as Gymshark uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash sonoro, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash sonoro to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash sonoro. Get softer, smoother, and more even toned skin after just one use with the new Gentle Exfoliating Line from Cetaphil. Formulated with a unique triple acid blend that promotes surface skin cell renewal, these gentle chemical exfoliators remove dead skin cells and refine skin's texture while hydrating, resulting in softer, smoother, more even looking skin. Shop the new Cetaphil Gentle Exfoliating Line in the face and body aisles at your local Target store or online at Cetaphil.com. Welcome to another episode of the Brown and Black Podcast. My name is Jack Rico. And I'm Mike Sargent. And every week we take a look at race and pop culture through a brown and black lens. So I was researching to see what we would talk about in this particular episode, and I bumped into the story about Richie Valens. I think you had sent it to me as well. Yes. And it just started, everybody started seeing it. And as I'm looking at the story, I'm not sure if you saw the original, Mike, but I fucking loved that 1987 Lou Diamond Phillips version with Isai of Morales. Course. In 1957, Ricardo Valenzuela had his family, his talent, and ball tonight. The dream. Rock and roll. Come on, baby. Just of course, didn't everybody love that movie? I, I always thought, yes, it's it's a classic. So wait a minute, you saw it like when you were a kid in '87. Uh, of course, of course, yes, I did. I saw. What it made when I was you? What made you want to see that movie? For me, the song was very catchy. Exactly, and it's funny. Because you've made me think, obviously, before we did this episode, and I thought you might ask me this question. What would compel me as an African-American to want to see this movie, yes. The Bamba? But I remember the thing I always liked about, and again, I grew up here in New York, so just going to give a little bit of a, a, a disclaimer here. So my perception of blacks and Latinos and how we integrate and all of that was very different than maybe, let's just say, the rest of the country. Mm-hmm. But to me, a lot of times I'd hear Spanish, and it's I, I, it's gibberish to me. And then they'd say either A, something in English, or something I could get. So it's like, la, 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 la bamba. So it's not only something that was cool, but it's something I could sing along with. It was on the radio. I didn't even realize that it was from the 50s until, wow. again, the commercials are on. It's one of those songs you'd heard it somewhere. So it was the music, the song, like, oh, this is the guy who wrote that song. Oh, this, oh, I didn't know. I knew the song, but I had no concept of the history or the artist who made it. So I think that was one of the great significant things about that movie in particular. It's that it was also partly like a documentary. It was like a historical story about our culture, about Hispanic culture. And I never really saw it like that because that movie was so mainstream, bro. It was so whitewashed too. It was funny. I didn't even know Lou Diamond Phillips was Native American. I had no clue. I thought the guy was Latino. Can I say something here for a second? But think about this for a second. I was like, yo, dude, you're an honorary Latino because you fooled me. But can I pause you for a second? 1987, okay, 
w- w- anybody could play Latino. Al Pacino could play Latino. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. you didn't really think about right authenticity in wow, the world. Wow, you're right. And the thing is, us Latinos, there was no outrage about it. It wasn't that long ago that Scarface was still like one of the greatest Latino movies ever until we all kind of became a little bit more woke, which is where this movie comes in. I want to talk about this Richie Valens La Bamba remake and what it means in this remake, reimagination, why it's being released right now, why Hollywood said yes to it. What are some of the issues that I already foresee with this? But then also, what are some of the opportunities as well? One of them is you and I, Mike, speaking about it right now as a topic of conversation. But I just want to get to the meat and potatoes of what that movie essentially symbolizes and represents, Mike. things that hit me as soon as I heard that story. And I'm not sure about you because I want to hear what your take was as soon as you heard that this was a remake. But as soon as I saw it, I was like, okay, if this shit's going to happen, this has to be about his identity and the, the, the collapse of identity of Hispanic culture, the embracement of whiteness. If you really look at the movie, man, we're talking about a Chicano. Somebody who's second generation American. First generation was mom and dad were Mexican. Then he lives in San Fernando Valley, listens to Mexican music, doesn't speak any Spanish. And fully fucking assimilates, man. So he becomes Mexican-American and identifies as a Mexican-American. Do you know that when he sang La Bamba for the first time, he, he didn't know any Spanish? He just, he sung it phonetically. But because he wanted to, and he sounded amazing at it, but the dude didn't know Spanish. That's pretty fascinating. What we also see with Richie Valens embracing whiteness is through the music. It wasn't enough for his Chicano music to just be Chicano. A lot of people are cool with that, man. Look at regional Mexican music right now. They love being Mexican. But he loved rock and roll. And he loved all types of music, including black. And all of that just spun into his Mexicanness and all this Americanness to create that La Bamba sound. We saw the birth of Chicano Rock, yet the movie never framed it like that. That's a loss of a milestone in Hispanic history, in Latino history in America. And then who does he fall in love with? Not a Latina, a white girl named Donna. Oh, Donna. And in my head, it never even fucking occurred to me that Hispanics look at white women as trophies or something. So to him, if I'm moving up, then I should move up in the race of my women too. And it reminds me of that scene in Border Town. The movie's called Border Town. It was back in the 1930s where Paul Mooney played Johnny Gutierrez and he tells his girlfriend at the time, I want to, I want to marry you. Oh, but Johnny, you're being romantic. And that's out of character. Now, listen, now I'm serious. But you can't be. Marriage isn't for us, not even to talk about. <laughs> Why, it's for me to talk about. I love you. I, I, I'm asking you to marry me. Oh, but that's out of the question. You must understand that, Johnny. No, I don't understand. 
Why? Well, because... Because you belong to a different tribe, Savage. You belong to a different tribe, Savage. And Paul Mooney wasn't even Hispanic. <laughs> he was a white guy who played a Latino. But for the time, I guess it was okay. Let me just pause you there. Representation of Latino, even though it's not played by a Latino. <laughs> but shit. You see what I'm saying? Oh, I, you know I do. You see what I'm saying? It's like even in the praise, I can't fully praise us without like the backhanded, you know. Now, I want you to remember that phrase you just used. I can't fully praise us because I'm going to bring it up later. Luis Valdez, who was the original director of that film, and we owe him that because that movie's become one of the greatest, you know, entertaining looks at uh, prestige cinema for Latinos that we've seen. And, you know, that movie, when it came out in 87, it came out in the summer of 87. The movie didn't hit as much as the music. The music was number one on the hot Billboard 100. The album, the soundtrack, was number one for like three weeks. And Mike, here's the other thing that a lot of people don't talk about either. When you were singing the song, the whole song was in Spanish. Not one bit was in English. It was fully in Spanish. So what did we see with this in the late 80s? You know what was happening around that time? New Kids on the Block were the biggest thing. Michael Jackson, Madonna, Bobby Brown, Whitney Houston. Dude, we were at the peak of the 80s. This was pop culture. And while this is happening, this movie's coming out. And it's like the only thing that Hispanics can look at as mainstream, like real mainstream. The thing about music is that as much as you can argue that music is storytelling, it just doesn't beat movies and the way movies are framed to storytell. It hits deeper. Seeing white people, black people like Mike Sargent singing Spanish, the same language that I speak at home with my mom and dad and my family. That same one is embraced by my black friend, Mike. I feel seen. White people. Damn. I thought the gap between us was huge, but <laughs> if there's a great hook on a song, music will bring us together. What I think I want from that movie now, Mike, is some authenticity, some like, let's dig into his identity. He sold out is an argument you could say. Yo, dude, did you just leave like your Chicano Latino roots, man, to become white? No one's calling you out on that, huh? You're whitewashed, Richie. Wasn't your name Richie Valenzuela? These guys said, well, if you want to reach a broader audience, Richie, you're going to have to choose two things. Either stick with your name and love of your family and your culture, your parents who gave you the Valenzuela name, or you can sell your soul <laughs> and change it to Valens. <laughs> You'd think that a moral, righteous man of values and character would say, No, I'm not taking that pact, you devil. No. Richie didn't choose Hispanic. Richie said yes to being Richie Valens. And Richie became famous. That whole portion today hits differently, Mike. That's all I'm saying. If I had, if they said, hey, Jack, you know what? We're going to hire you to write the new La Bamba movie. How would you do it? I go, the conflict of his Mexican-American identity. 
You guys glossed over that. And I get it. It wasn't meant to happen in that movie at that time. But now, where we're all too woke, we're about to have a multicultural president, man. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez at the DNC looked like the next Latina president. It's happening. You got to talk about race. Everything about our lives is racialized. Stop acting like it's not. So you got to be able to talk about how that impacted him. Was it a burden he had to carry? Or did he not give a fuck? And what did other people think? I know that in the movie, his brother had issues with him. Let's bring that out. Actually, here's what I would do, man. I wouldn't even make it about the music. Pa'ke, are you telling me that you're going to try and compete with that 87 moment in the summer of 87? Musically? Don't even try it. No one wants to be a part of a remake that's already been done perfectly. That is going to be something very interesting because if the music was the thing that drew you in about the original, then for this audience, the identity is going to have to replace the music and make it as dynamic. The music has to be the background. Use the music as a storytelling device, moving the story forward, as opposed to being the full focus and then focus on this guy's rise. Because, dude, it was meteoric. I don't know if any other Hispanic rose that fast that quick. It lasted one year. He hit the charts in 58. And did so much within that one year that in 59, he died. Imagine if he was still alive. It reminds us of Selena. Died too young. And she was about to cross over. So you were about to have, in American musical history, Chicana rock go mainstream during the 50s. And by the way, that was also the foreshadowing of the birth of Chicano culture, the Chicano movement of the 60s. Cesar Chavez was already listening to him and everybody else. They were ready to take this on, man. That must have been empowering for a lot of Mexicans around that time. I know that in 87, I was like, wow, this guy existed and I didn't even know about it? Whose fault is that? So... Clearly, I have a lot on my chest about this remake, Mike. I want them to get it right. I don't think we need it. But if you're going to put it out regardless, Luis Valdez said, yo, I'm involved, but it's not my idea. We need a hit, Mike. A hit is the solution. Crazy Rich Asians and what it did for Asian American storytelling in the United States and making it very friendly for white audiences, including black audiences. Huge, transformative. Changed the way you look at the Asian culture. Black Panther changed the tone, the racial tone of conversations within its release. In the Heights was supposed to do that for us. Blue Beetle was supposed to do that for us. Batgirl was supposed to do that for us. <sighs> Mike, it's the only way it's going to work, man. It has to be an asteroid crater like the one that killed the dinosaurs. It has to be that cosmic level hit it just changes the culture we are looking at that necessary hit to be able to make the shifts in every other aspect of society and i think it begins there there's so many things you said there that i want to respond to but I'm just going to go back to the top when you said me seeing the movie and why did I want to see La Bamba? And you, you told me all these things that you wanted this movie to be. 
and the idea of, of the meteor, the crater, I want to come back to that towards the end. Thinking about the birth of Chicano rock and thinking about being successful as a black person, to me, and, and I, I, I guess it, I didn't even think about it consciously, but a successful Latino was always, in many ways, let's just say embraced by white, to the point where it didn't matter that they were Latino. They just happened to have that name. Whether you're, if you're Andy Garcia, he didn't play Latinos for large part of his young career. Joan Baez, how many people back then were thinking, oh, she's a Latina? Nobody even knew Linda Ronstadt or Linda Carter were. So to me, these were things that like, okay, they have a last name or you might find out, but it didn't really mean anything. He or she may be advancing representation, but in an almost invisible way. Yeah. And then the question, is that good or right? Like at, at a certain point, yeah, you become mainstream, but is mainstream, you've become white? Do you, how white do you have to be to become mainstream? And the dichotomy with black people is that black people, are, they can't be white. They don't have a choice but to be what they are. Yeah. And if it becomes a hit, it becomes cool, it becomes what everybody's into, whether it's music or film or this or that, comedy, whoever you are in pop culture, it's because you're representing, which is a whole other thing, you're representing being Black. You're influencing how people see Black people. The, the stakes always seemed to mm -hmm. be much higher mm -hmm. to me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when you say all of this, I, I think about also the context. I said earlier, back in the 80s, anybody could play Latino. But then Ben Affleck played Tony Mendez, <laughs> they remade a whole movie about Egypt, uh, Exodus, Gods and Kings. They just put eyeliner on white actors. At, at a certain point, if Joel Edgerton can play Ramses and Christian Bale is going to play Moses and they're supposed to be Egyptian, and we still have this view of Egyptians on film as these white people, that is mainstream. Those are big movies. Those were Oscar winning movies. And at a certain point, I feel, and again, only because you've made me think about this, at what point is there acknowledgement? And I went back to the 50s and I was looking at, okay, what was going on in the 50s? We had I Love Lucy, right? That was a whole other thing. That should have, that was the, right, that was a crater. That was a huge hit. We, huge we, we, hit. And you know, we had Jose Ferrar won the first Oscar. So I'm thinking like, okay, it's this mainstream. It's at the end of the day, it's not like all of a sudden there were, after Desi Arnaz, like what other Latino executives were there ever in TV for decades? It's like you break through, you do this. And if you live, you might do it for a while. But does anything change? Does the perception change? Does the opportunity change? And then when it does, and I know we're going to get to this, how does it even get acknowledged? Those are the things that really stood out to me. And in this remake, in this, for lack of a better term, post-woke era, like you said, everybody's a lot more aware. Now we've gone back and looked at things and yeah, Al Pacino shouldn't have played a Latino in two separate films in Carlitos way too. So now we look back, what kind of film will be made? Like you said, all right, he'll take the paycheck, but what's he going to ensure? Is it the casting? Is it like you said, the struggle for identity. Why are they putting up the money? Is it because somebody had a strong pitch and said, hey, look, this made a lot of money before we can make more money and everything, it's an IP? Or is there, do, is, will there be anything significant cultural that could happen in terms of representation, in terms of, as you say, opening those doors? I don't know. History tells me that it won't. This brings me to my following conversation with you, Mike. And it's about exactly this. But this, what I'm about to reveal to you, my friend, is catastrophic, potentially. It's a national crisis that needs to be looked at because what I found out just put chills in my body.
Mike, you were talking about Richie Valens, the La Bamba remake by Sony Pictures. And, you know, as we were talking about it, that wasn't just the only thing I had discovered that week. I was actually bombarded by Latino news in the mainstream. And it was these following stories that hit at the same exact time that this Richie Valens remake was being announced. The Menendez Brothers Netflix movie is coming out. Then Jenna Ortega has been doing the rounds with Beetlejuice. And dude, everyone's going crazy over Jenna Ortega internationally, domestically. She's a global star. Then you send me that story on Bad Bunny, who how he's now collaborating with Darren Aronofsky. Holy shit. Yeah. Talk about prestige. Yes. Then at the Venice Film Festival, Emilia Perez, which is a Selena Gomez, Zoe Saldana, Edgar Ramirez movie. And it's doing amazing. And Netflix also has it. And she's in nominated for an Emmy for Only Murders in the Building. And season four is coming out. So she's been doing press. So she's been all over the place. Aubrey Plaza, she just got a feature in the Wall Street Journal. Carlos Alcaraz, best tennis player in the world. He's rolling into the U.S. Open right now. The Metropolitan Museum of Art emailed me, and they're like, hey, we're doing a Mexican art retrospect. And a few things came into my head. Like, two things really just hit me about all this. Number one, we're part of the mainstream, brother. We've been a part of the mainstream for close to 200 years. And so this, to me, this should be normal. But let me tell you what's going on here, man. All of these stories, the way I see it, I'm like celebrating it, Mike. I'm celebrating it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Aubrey's at the Wall Street Journal. Jenna's getting so much love. And maybe it's the Latino journalist in me that doesn't see us in mainstream media. So I'm happy when I see a brown face or a Hispanic name in mainstream places. So I celebrate in it. I revel when they appear in mainstream. But you know what I noticed in that celebration? That no one else is celebrating with me, Mike. There's an explosion going on. How come no one's talking about it? It's like gas. It's like it's there in the air, but you can't see it. Invisible. It's invisible. But it's there. And it's invisible not because it really physically is. It's because you decided not to see us. You want to make a million people disappear? Here's how you do it. Don't cover them. Don't nominate them. Don't talk about them. We're just not gonna register you. Epistemic erasure. And that's what they've done since the beginning of media in America. Now, let me tell you, Mike, why it should be a big fucking deal. Let me tell you why this shit should be on the front covers of everything. Okay? Every time that you see a Latino story in mainstream elite media, the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker, the way Ivan Cornejo was covered for regional Mexican music in there, when you see those stories there, my initial reaction is of celebration. You know why? Simple. It's rare. It's scarce. It's not common. And it's historic. It's historic discrimination. Understand that since the 1800s, Mike, Anglo media has done nothing else than portray the Mexican as a second-class human. 
Like they got to deal with them. And it's all related to the Mexican-American War and who owns land and who labors that land. And so because the media has always put the Mexican as that sleepy, lazy, working class Mexican escaping the revolution and that, yeah, those losers from the Mexican-American War, yeah, those guys, we're not going to cover them. And when we do talk about them, we're going to talk about all the negative stuff like immigration, the cultural stuff. But you know what we're not going to do with it, Mike? Here's what they're saying. Subtext. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover these stories. Yeah. But hey, don't tell the Latinos, but a little hollow, please. Don't acknowledge the history of discrimination that hasn't allowed this coverage that's happening right now to happen in the last almost 200 years. Yeah, no nuance. Don't bring up any of the negative shit, the stuff that we're guilty of. Yeah, make it neutrally celebratory, uplifting. Yeah. But don't confess to any guilt of what we've done to them. And I'm here like celebrating and going, whoa, 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 whoa. Is this like a guilty, uh, a guilt trip article? Are all these guilt trip articles, Mike, from white media? Because I got to tell you, Latinos aren't connecting to it. No one talks about these fucking articles. And you know what then hit me, man? <laughs> this revelation. These articles do not have me in mind when they write it. They have mostly white readers in mind. It's for them, Mike, not me. And you know, it's hard to accept that truth, man, that I'm not even considered as a reader for my own cultural stories. I think what's important for the Latino readers is that every time they see a Latino story in the mainstream, celebrate it. Because we should be there. We should be there every day. It should be like 50-50. But we're not. They're whitewashing Latino stories for white readers, Mike. And it's like a, it's like a paradox. Because like in one way, you, you feel really good about it. You feel seen by them. But are they truly acknowledging the significance, Mike? Are they telling the whole story, Mike, when they cover us? Or are they covering us just for vanity, just for tokenism, just for show? I'm standing on the outside. I'm not Latino, but as, especially in the last five years, I've been immersed in, as they say, Latinidad. And... You said earlier, I can't fully praise. So even in your celebration of things from, let's say, formative years, you could only celebrate so much, whether it's Chico and the Man, La Bamba, whatever it is, that there is a representation. Scarface, there is a representation, but you can't fully praise it, conscious or unconsciously. And how long has that been programmed into being Latino? You can only praise it, but so much. Modern Family was like the number one. She's the highest paid Latina actress ever on television. Okay, probably, I think the highest paid actress, period, like in a sitcom. But can you completely celebrate that character? Right. Can, can you fully praise? It's like a paradox. Ex right, it's a paradox. So that paradox, I think, is part of what contributes. Like you said, Add everything you said now. So when you read about it, there's this passionate telling of it. It doesn't really acknowledge anything. So you're used to not acknowledging. So yeah, there it is. Oh, wow. Darren Aronofsky. I don't know that I even see his films. Oh, yeah, there it is. The Menendez brothers. Can you really celebrate that? Yeah, Javier Bardem's in it, but can you really fully praise that this is the representation? So I think that paradox plays a factor. And it's something you've made me think about. And I wonder what your thoughts are if you think I'm 
crazy to think that, or if you think that is a factor, just that ongoing, consistent, just used to not being able to fully praise or fully reveal. And the last thing I'll say is I was in a meeting with some friends of mine who were Latino, like a project, and they wanted my, my opinion on it. And they asked each other, what is uh, Hispanic Heritage Month? They didn't know. I knew. And I gave them the date, but none of them, these three men, all educated, all successful, even knew. Most Latinos I know are like, yeah, who cares about Hispanic Heritage Month? Because we don't even call ourselves Hispanic anymore. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you is, Jack, I see this as a paradox and I see this as a sort of almost a social conditioning that I'm assuming Latinos have to wrestle with. The whole ongoing paradox of never being able to fully praise or celebrate? Do you feel that's part of why a lot of these stories aren't even acknowledged? Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it, Mike. Maybe I think that there's a disconnect. All this stuff to me should be front page news. All of it. Look, the narrative of Latinos in America is that we are trying to be equal to the dominant group, which is the white group in America. Educationally, we want to go to Harvard. We want to be presidents of the United States too. We want to do it all equally. If you have the opportunity to do it, I have the opportunity to do it. But dude, that's not the story. So then what ends up happening, Mike? It's that you just get used to being ignored. From... 2008 to 2014, there was a study done where Latino related stories made up less than, are you ready for this? 1% of network news coverage. And this is when everybody used to watch network news. Wow. And out of that 1%, 0.4% focused specifically on Latinos. You basically might as well not just cover us. Like, why did you even bring it up? And then in 2023, a study was done where only 5.6% of the articles on race in mainstream media mentioned Latinos. What's that percentage? 5.6. 5.6. Out of 100. So this means that even when the media is talking about racial issues in the conversation that I'm in, yo, we're completely shut out of that conversation. So what this data shows us is that Latinos in mainstream media are there, but are almost systematically being ignored. It's almost like the whites and the blacks got together and the Asians all got together and they said, yo, you know what? We're now the cool kids. Let's exclude the Latinos. Don't bring it up when we talk about country music. Don't bring up the Latinos when we talk about hip hop either. Yeah, yeah. So when I see this paltry, shocking, disturbing, alarming numbers, Less than 6% through the fucking board, Mike. And just to give context, Latinos make up 19.5% of the population. Blacks actually make up 14.4% of the country's population, still less than Latinos. So that's a shocking stat. It feels almost deliberate, man. Like I'm starting to go, yo, dude, what is going on here? Should I be calling my lawyer? That's what this shit feels like. That's what this shit feels like. Another layer to the whole thing is like, okay, so thanks for a lot for covering us, but what kind of Latino are you covering? The Menendez brothers and the NFL is an American true crime story that Americans loved to digest true crime. And if it's a Latino in there that is white passing, even better. Jenna Ortega's Puerto Rican Mexican. She is a unicorn, brother, because she's not like white passing. 
but it's her proximity in the mainstream. Being in the mainstream gives you proximity to white culture. That's right. And all of the benefits and the ideology. And that's where I think we were talking about the Richie Valens thing. How did that hit him? Yo, dude, you went from like poor Mexican with all of the discrimination historically to, yo, you got your private plane with Buddy Holly. At 17. 17 years old. Come on, Mike. When you get a Latino who's ethnic, you got to whitefy them. You got to whitewash them. You got to make them friendly to me and my white psyche and to my friends and family and everybody I associate with. So what does this Latino look like to my white friends? How do I put that overlay on him? What stereotype do I choose? What schema or framework do I have throughout my life that I could put on this? We're not allowed to come in authentically, Mike. We're not allowed to come in with our own accents. We have to fit a lens. We have to fit an idea. We have to fit a story. But the question I would ask you is, did you ever have the story? Were you ever in control of the narrative? I feel like someone doesn't realize something's being taken away from them if they've never really had it. Damn, but dude. I Shit. Essentially, what you're saying is we never had a story. You had a story, but you, you, but you weren't in control. Of it. We had a story, bro, and they took it away from us. Right. We're passive people, man. We're not colonialists. We never were. We're the ones that are constantly colonized. Mexicans were colonized by the Spaniards, by Europeans, and Puerto Ricans, Cubans, the whole Caribbean, Latin America, Spaniards in the United States. They're the colonizers. They're the ones that are willing to kill. And we're the ones that are willing to uprise. And to them, that's the Hunger Games. And we're always losing that damn war. Mainstream media is going to have to do the following thing. At some point, they're going to have to just bring us in, bring in a Latino editor-in-chief, and it's going to happen in movies, in television shows. It's going to happen everywhere. We're going to see our day. We're going to see a hit show. And we're going to celebrate it, Mike. We're going to celebrate it like every Latin American independence they put together at the same exact time. That's it for this episode of Brown and Black. If you would like to support this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. Your help will allow us to be heard by many more people. You can follow our comments and opinions on at Brown Black Podcast on Instagram, Threads, and YouTube. We'll see you on the next episode of, of Brown, Brown and, and Black. Black. It is Ryan Seacrest here. People always say it's good to unwind, but that's easier said than done. The exception, Chumba Casino. They actually make it easier done than said, or at least the same. Chumba Casino is an online social casino with hundreds of casino-style games like slots and blackjack. Play for fun. Play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Sign up now and collect your free welcome bonus at ChumbaCasino.com. Sponsored by Chumba Casino. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply.